Welcome to The Zone. In today's episode, we'll be diving into a long requested video, a summary of the story that inspired it all, Roadside Picnic. Warning, this video will contain heavy spoilers. I would also like to say that this very short book is incredibly dense with themes and ideas, and some of these may not be contained in this video for the sake of brevity. Feel free to share your ideas and interpretations in the comments below. My video that reviews and discusses these themes will be released later. As always, if you enjoy the video, feel free to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out. Without further ado, let's dive in. The world of Roadside Picnic begins with a discussion between Dr. Pillman and a radio interviewer, discussing what is referred to as the visitation. Dr. Pillman sets the stage that the world of Roadside Picnic takes place in, and through this interview we learn that it has been 13 years since the event that changed human history forever. On an uneventful night, in six separate and unrelated locations across the globe, the laws of physics changed. People were afflicted with diseases, some were outright killed, and others were mutated. At these six locations, called Zones by Pillman, areas remained forever and inexplicably changed. It is only after Pillman was able to research the locations of the zones that he was able to uncover that intelligent extraterrestrials had traveled from somewhere in the Cygnus system and landed on Earth. The zones and the effects that they produce are a direct consequence of the alien visitors interacting with our planet and our ecosystem. As the interview continues, Pillman is pressed to give an answer to what the visitors could have wanted and what their intentions were. The scientist explains that he doesn't like to speculate on the reasons, but he reflects on the random nature of where the zones are located across the globe. He speculates that the landing sites were not chosen, but were merely random and circumstantial. He uses the example of shooting a gun at a rotating ball to determine the path that the aliens took and how they landed, and also explains that this pillment radiant, as he calls it, was how he determined the origin of the visitors. The visitors stayed for a very short time at these locations and then soon left. Throughout the interview, the radio host continues to ask how the event changes humanity, how objects left behind by visitors could be used for science, and above all else, what it all means. Pillman reservedly responds by stating that this is not his area of expertise, and the most important thing we can learn from the visitation is that humanity is not alone in the universe. The discussion ends with the two talking about the flow of alien technology, called artifacts, coming out of the zone, and how scavengers called stalkers have been illegally smuggling them out of the zone for a profit. Part 1 of Roadside Picnic begins from the perspective of the main character, Red Short, a 23-year-old lab assistant at the newly founded International Institute of Extraterrestrial Cultures located in the Harmont Zone in Canada. He and his friend and co-worker, Kirill, are in the lab experimenting on an artifact called an empty, two discs which seem to be locked in place over one another. While Red sees Kirill's attempts to understand the alien artifacts as futile and can only think about grabbing a drink at the local bar, Kirill is obsessed with understanding the artifacts and unlocking their secrets for the betterment of mankind. Red thinks back to his adventures into the zone as a stalker, and thinks about how much money selling his artifacts to the local fence would make him. As Kirill is becoming more worn down with his futile research attempts, Red informs Kirill of a full empty, two discs that contain a mysterious blue energy. This lifts Kirill's spirits and he asks Red to guide him into the zone. They plan on their excursion with another worker at the institute named Tender, and plan on taking him the next morning. The next day, Red enters the building as normal and is met with a request to meet with the facility's head of security. While Red is confused about the out-of-ordinary meeting with the security chief, he is soon confronted with reports that he is engaging in illegal trips into the zone. Although they have no physical evidence of these illicit adventures, they make it known that he was being watched. The chief also reveals that Red has been arrested for illegal stalking before and lets him know that his punishment this time will be much more severe than the last time he was caught. He meets with Kirill again after the meeting with the security chief, and the two argue as Red no longer wishes to show his friend the artifact. 
He reasons that it's off the officially known paths and would raise suspicions about how Red could have known where the artifact was. The two come up with a plan to avoid scrutiny, and Kirill offers a substantial bonus to Red, who is enticed by the possibility of having drinking money for the foreseeable future. The two call Tender, their third man, and prepare for their mission. The group equips specialized protective suits which are designed to protect from the harsh environment of the zone, but Red notes how the suits really do nothing to actually protect someone from the anomalies. For further protection, the group also uses a hovercraft-type vehicle called a boot to float above the dangerous ground. These boots also contain a computer system that is capable of retracing the exact path used to enter the zone, allowing the crew to only travel on the safe ground where there are no anomalies. As the crew set out on their adventure, it's here that we get our first real description of the events that the visitation had on humanity. Red first notes the fleet of trucks that have sat idle for years, some being older than 30 years old, which are still in perfect condition. He contrasts this with new metal barrels that were used to store fuel and equipment, which have rusted to almost nothing after only being in the zone for a few months. The laws of space and time seem to no longer apply in the zone, and it's revealed how alien the place truly is. As they pilot through the abandoned coal town, he looks out at the plant and rail systems standing still, as if they were just left yesterday. They enter the Blind Quarter, which was home to the unfortunate victims who were blinded during the visitation, not by seeing a bright light or by chemicals, but by a loud noise. This neighborhood was partially blinded by the event. Another section of the town called the Plague Quarter was afflicted by a horrible disease that caused the victim's skin, hair, and fingernails to fall out. He also notes that the zone has an odd way of acting, and that this mysterious furry cotton grows only on the antennas in the Plague Quarter, and even more strange, it's found nowhere else in the zone. The group continues through the zone, throwing nuts and bolts to detect anomalies that are in their path. They encounter gravity-based anomalies, and more notably, an acidic anomaly called the Witch's Jelly, which Red reveals was the same anomaly that killed a fellow stalker only a few days before. After finally reaching their destination, Red and Kirill exit the boot and descend to the surface. They make their way through the garage and go to the full empty where Kirill unknowingly backs into a spiderweb-like substance. Red, sure that his co-worker is certainly going to die from exposure to this anomalous spiderweb, alerts Kirill, who has already made contact with the web. Kirill moves away and is seemingly unaffected by the anomaly, relieving both of the men of their anxiety. The crew returns to the Institute where they are scrubbed down and decontaminated. The entire facility has heard of their successful adventure, and they hail them as heroes. International news teams come to interview the crew. Red collects his bonus, and Kirill and Red shake hands and say goodbye for the evening, as Red heads into town to a local stalker bar called The Borscht. On his way into the bar, Red is stopped by blue-helmeted soldiers from the UN, who to Red's surprise stop to congratulate him on his sanctioned artifact hunt. They also know how proud they are of him for turning his life around and for giving up illegal stalking, to which Red simply nods his head and agrees with them. Once he reinforces their ideas that he will no longer be making any illegal trips into the zone, he continues on to the bar. Red begins his long night of drinking where he is approached by a man working for the Institute who is attempting to relocate the local population in an effort to get them as far away from the zone as possible. Red notes that he was born in this town and has no desire to leave, like many of the citizens. It's here that we learn what our main character really thinks of the rest of the world, which, in his view, creates boring and numb lives that aren't worth living. He assumes that if he was to leave and was relocated to somewhere in Europe or the USA, he would simply be given a 9-to-5 job, one that would pay his bills and allow him time to watch TV at night until he falls asleep. Uninterested in the banal existence of a working-class man, he refuses and ends the conversation. After chasing away the Institute representative, Red continues drinking 
He chats with the bar owner and local fence, Ernest. As the night goes on, some of the locals begin coming into the bar and meeting with Red. His friends include Godlin, a large African man who is deeply religious, and Dick Noonan, an older and chubby businessman. The three exchange pleasantries and offer each other drinks. Red's conversation with Godlin focuses on the zone, where Godlin makes remarks that stalkers are servants of the devil, and they should not disturb the zone. Red retorts and quotes his friend Kirill, and says that the zone is a blessing that can be used to better mankind, even though Red truly doesn't believe it. Red reveals to us that Godlin is one of the few religious stalkers who will illegally purchase artifacts from the black market fences, only to sneak the artifacts back into the zone at night and bury them. As the friends debate and drink together, they are interrupted by a small boy named Creon, who has a message for Red. Creon informs that Kirill has suddenly died, apparently due to a heart attack. Red is distraught by the news. Drunk and angry at the world, he blames the visitors, the Institute, illegal artifact traders, but more importantly, he blames himself. Godlin also becomes very angry and creates a disturbance. As the police are about to enter the bar to put the disturbance down, Red makes his way out the back and throws an itcher, which creates a loud piercing noise, both as a distraction and a way to get back at those he partially blames for Kirill's death. After Red escapes the bar, he's in mental shambles, and looking for any form of comfort he can find, he makes his way to Gouda, his girlfriend. He meets her on the street, but instead of comfort, she informs him that she's pregnant with his child. She informs Red that her mother demands that she abort the child. Gouda reminds Red of the fact that all children of stalkers who have entered the zone have been born horribly deformed, but she doesn't care and she's willing to marry him anyway and have his child. Part 1 ends. Part 2 of Roadside Picnic picks up five years later, after Part 1. The scene opens with Red and an older stalker named Buzzard on an illegal artifact hunt in the zone. The mission is completely thrown off course when Buzzard accidentally steps into an anomaly, which causes his legs to be dissolved up to his knees. Buzzard, in his pain and delirium, begs Red not to leave him, and even promises to provide Red with the location of a legendary golden ball in the very heart of the zone, an artifact that is capable of granting the deepest wishes of the one who finds it. Red disregards the legend as a fairy tale, but agrees to help Buzzard in order to calm him down. They avoid patrols and faking their way through a checkpoint, and Red races to Butcher, a doctor who is commonly assisting stalkers in return for artifacts. Buzzard is examined by Butcher, who begins to prep for an immediate amputation operation on the wounded man. It's also revealed that Butcher is a world-renowned expert on non-human illnesses thanks to the research he's been able to gather from his patients. With Buzzard in stable condition, Red finally returns home with a bag full of artifacts. He returns home and is greeted by Gouda, his now wife, and his child, named Monkey, who was not aborted as Gouda's mother had wished. Monkey was, however, born with odd mutations. She's covered in golden fur, but is otherwise normal. After greeting his family, Red washes up as Gouda makes him breakfast and coffee. Red notes that his artifact hunting has been able to provide for his family and keep a roof over their heads. As Red eats his breakfast, he counts up the artifacts that he has found, and he is pleased with himself. Wishing that he could go to sleep, but knowing he has a meeting with his new prospective buyer, he gets dressed and takes the bag of loot to meet with the fence. As he makes his way to the fence, it's revealed to the reader that Harmount is now a larger town with hotels and businesses. Nice cars can be seen on the street, and many international agents, UN troops, and scientists are stationed here due to the town's proximity to the zone. Because of the promise of riches and opportunity, many civilians have also relocated to the city, bringing with them businesses and investment, but most simply end up working blue-collar service jobs. Red stops at a cafe to grab a cup of coffee where he runs into Dick Noonan, who is now moving up in his position at the International Institute. The two talk for a moment, 
and Noonan offers Red a job, informing him that real people can do a better job than the robotic stalkers that the Institute is now using to search for artifacts. Red agrees simply to get Noonan to leave him alone, and after he is sure Dick is gone, Red proceeds to the hotel to meet his buyer, Throaty. Red sells the artifacts and gets a large amount of money for them. Throaty is pleased that Red was able to bring back some of the more rare artifacts, which are worth far more money. Although he's happy about the artifacts, he informs Red that there is something he wants even more, and that he is willing to pay Red enough to retire if he brings it. He gives Red a porcelain container and tells him to call when he has found it. Red takes the money and leaves the hotel. Although he wants to sleep more than anything else in the world, he forces himself to go and visit Buzzard's wife and children, who are also horribly deformed. He hands Buzzard's wife the half of the cash and informs her that her husband was caught in an anomaly. Unfazed by the news, she asks if her husband is dead. Red recounts the story to her, telling her that he had to drag Buzzard out of the zone in order to save him. Instead of thanking Red for saving her husband, she's enraged and screams at him, demanding why Red didn't just let him die. As if she can read his mind, she guesses that Buzzard promised Red the golden ball, and she calls him a fool for believing Buzzard. Red rationalizes that Buzzard is a terrible person and a horrible father, and he can understand why she would feel that way. But he's more insulted that she would call him a fool. Red slaps her and leaves, after giving her her half of the money. Red calls a cab and falls asleep. To his surprise, he awakens outside of the stalker bar instead of at home. The cab driver informs Red that he was told to come to the rundown bar by a half-asleep Red. Red, now annoyed, as he just wants to crawl into his warm bed, gets out of the cab and goes into the Borscht, the name of the stalker bar, simply to meet with Ernest over the proposed meeting set up by Dick Noonan. He meets with his old fence and is led back into a room where he is surprised as UN troops are sitting at a table. Ernest stares at the floor as Red is interrogated by the soldiers, who list every item that Red and Buzzard sold to Throaty. They find the rest of the money on Red's person, which is all they need for a conviction. Red throws the money on the floor, enraged. As they order Red to pick up the money off the floor, he notices a trap door that leads to a wine cellar. Red takes his only chance and uses the trap door to escape through the cellar. He's able to get back up to the streets and makes his way through, escaping the foot patrols on the street. Red gets to a payphone and makes a call to Throaty, informing him that the UN is onto them. He also demands that Throaty give money to his wife while he's away in prison. Red then calls his wife and tells her that he's going to be arrested and that it should only be for a few months, and that she needn't worry. Part 2 ends with Red turning himself in. Part 3 begins from the perspective of Dick Noonan, who is now the head of supplies for the Institute. Noonan is called into a meeting with his boss, Mr. Lech. During the meeting, it's revealed that other zones have entirely different artifacts and anomalies, and they also discuss the Golden Ball. Noonan gives a list of all the known stalkers in the Harmon area, and he informs Lech that they are all retired or in prison. Lech berates Noonan and informs him that there are more than 6,000 artifacts smuggled out of the zone each month, and someone even smuggled out a sample of witch's jelly in a porcelain container, resulting in the death of 36 people. Noonan is ordered to put a stop to it. While asking around about the old stalkers, he's told that Red... Buzzard, Goodlin, and Creon are all straight shooters now, and they run businesses taking people on camping trips into the edge of the zone. They act as guides and make their money through legitimate means. Confused and determined to find the truth, Noonan sits and thinks in the bar. Noonan ends up bumping into Dr. Pillman, the famous scientist who discovered that the zones were actually the locations that the visitors stopped at. The two begin to talk about the nature of the Zone and humanity's place in the universe. They exchange theories about what the Zone is and what it means, Noonan thinking that it's a test by the visitors to see if humanity can understand their technology, and Pillman thinking the opposite. 
Pillman believes that the visitors had no intention of helping humanity at all, and that they were just so advanced they didn't even perceive humans as any different than any of the other animals on the planet. Instead of a blessing bestowed by the heavens, Pillman thinks that the zones are simply the places that visitors stopped at for a roadside picnic. He further strengthens the analogy by imagining a car pulling over for a picnic, where the picnickers leave trash and refuse all over the ground. Animals coming upon a spark plug or a plastic cup would be so bewildered by the trash, just as we are bewildered by the artifacts and anomalies in the zone. The two also discuss the immigrants, the people who are relocated from the zone into bigger cities, and how every person who has left the zone has had odd circumstances appear in their life. In one town where four immigrants lived, an unprecedented hurricane struck the city. In another, an immigrant working as a barber had every single client die in a single year. This has caused the international community to restrict people from leaving Harmont and the other zones. Noonan ends his discussion with Pillman and goes to see Red for the first time since he's been released from prison, determined to find out if he's one of the illegal stalkers still smuggling artifacts. When he arrives at Red's home, he finds that Red is not home yet, only Gouda and Monkey. Through Noonan's eyes, we learn that Monkey is now an unresponsive and almost catatonic creature, no longer a normal child with fur, but rather something else entirely. Gouda confesses to Noonan that the doctors have no idea what is wrong with her daughter, and that according to the latest DNA testing, Monkey is no longer even recognizable as human. Red arrives home, and the two old friends begin to talk and reminisce about the old times. We learn that Buzzard is crippled, Gudlin is leading a secret group of stalkers who are destroying artifacts in an attempt to destroy the zone. Ernest is apparently just a barman now. Part 3 ends with Red and Noonan engaged in fake but pleasant conversation, attempting to find out each other's true motives and nature. The final part of the book begins with Red and Buzzard's son Arthur venturing into the zone in search of the legendary golden ball. Buzzard promised Red $500,000 if he could retrieve it and bring it outside of the zone. At this point, Red is 31 and is jaded with his life. He wonders over and over why he keeps coming back to the zone when it only offers death and misery. He at first justifies that he does it for the money, but soon realizes he could have made just as much working a normal job with the Institute. He carries on, not knowing why, until he comes to the conclusion that if the Golden Ball is real, he will use it to fix his daughter. He obsesses about the ball, sounding more and more like Buzzard with each passing moment. The pair traverse the zone, walking past the graves of old stalkers. Red leads and guides Arthur, commenting to himself that one day Arthur could be a great stalker when he's a little older and wiser. He then starts to feel bad as he realizes that one of them will have to die on this trip, and it will be Arthur who dies. The two are then caught in a fire anomaly, which begins to burn them badly. Knowing that if they stand up or try to run away, they'll be burned to death, Red orders Arthur to lay down and bear the pain until the anomaly passes away. Arthur tries his best, but begins to crawl away and attempts to stand up. Red desperately holds him down as the young stalker screams. Red's clothing is badly burned, but he manages to save Arthur. After the anomaly passes, the pair realize that they're not badly burned at all. They only felt the sensation of the flames. Red is relieved by this and recognizes that he only saved Arthur because he needs to use him as a minesweeper, as a tool to save his daughter. The two continue on and arrive at a large swamp of green sludge. Red reflects on his life. He realizes that he's not a good man. He likens his life to one slime pit after another. He recalls the conversations with others who had said he's naturally malcontent and no matter what system he was in, he would never be happy with it. Red, while realizing all these things, almost dies in the slime pit, but Arthur is there to save him. Instead of being happy by being saved, Red is livid, thinking only of how many times in his life he's been manipulated into doing other things for other people, and how he's at the mercy of everyone else around him, and there's nothing that he can do about it. 
Arthur and Red finally make it to a deep chalk quarry, where they see the floating golden orb down below. Arthur rejoices and is ecstatic, while Red stares in amazement at the ball. Red has an overwhelming desire to touch the ball and then fall asleep next to it. While Red is staring at the ball, he doesn't notice Arthur running towards the ball and stripping off all of his clothes. Naked, Arthur makes his way to the golden orb. Determined to make his wish, Arthur snaps out of his trance and watches in amazement as Arthur runs towards their prize, about to make his wish. Screaming at the top of his lungs, Arthur makes the wish. Happiness for all. Free. No one leaves unsatisfied. As he is lifted into the air, and then suddenly ripped apart by an anomaly called the Meat Grinder. Red slumps down to the ground, taking in what just occurred. He pulls out a flask and drinks as he's in a daze. From experience, he knows that he should wait and give the Meat Grinder some time, as they can be unpredictable. As Red waits, he realizes that he can't even remember what he came to wish for. He thanks of the zone and all it means to him as a source of providing for his family, as well as it being the very thing that's taking his family away. He's bombarded by all the things that he could ever want or wish for, but he knows they're not the reason or what he truly wants. Red continues on a downward mental spiral, realizing that his whole life, he's never actually thought for himself, and that only now in this place does he truly see it. Red accepts that he's simply an animal, attempting to understand something far greater than himself, and he decides to let the ball look into his soul and discover his greatest desire. As he approaches the ball, Red hears the words, happiness for all, free, no one leaves unsatisfied, as the book ends. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I also hope this summary has encouraged you guys to check out the book for yourselves. There's so much that I wanted to add, but I simply couldn't because it would make the video even longer than it already is. Stay tuned for my review of the book, which should be coming out next week, barring any technical or scheduling difficulties. If you haven't already, feel free to like and subscribe. It sounds cliche, but it really helps the channel out. Until next time guys, I'll see you in the zone. This content was made possible by patrons like you.